welcome everybody. I uh, really appreciate uh, you coming to the first Lunch and Learn that's been organized by Cheryl Matthews. Cheryl, in case you don't know uh, or haven't met Cheryl yet, is our new Associate Director of Indigenization for the JIBC. And she's organized this session with uh, some of the other staff. It's, it's a great um, kickoff to what's going to be a number of events that are connected with the JIBC strategic commitment to indigenization, to Aboriginal education, and to Aboriginal learners. And Cheryl will, will talk a little bit more about that later. It's great to have Linda Gray here, and we do have Linda's book available in the library and we can talk more about that later. So, and just in case you don't know who I am, I'm Pam White, the Acting VP Academic at the moment. I'm the Dean of the School of Community and Social Justice. So, I, I can see that we've got staff here and we've also got uh, some other guests who are participating from outside of the JI. So, welcome to you and thank you very much, Dave Seaweed, for coming because Dave is on the Aboriginal Education Advisory Council for the JIBC and also the Aboriginal Coordinator at Douglas College. So it's great uh, to see that we've got a combination of faculty, staff and uh, community members here today and welcome everybody. So I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl now and to kick off the event. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. So I've actually technically been here three months, so I don't know if that uh, still means that I'm new, but I'm not as new as I used to be. <laughs> so first I'd like to thank the Coast Salish people for allowing us into their territory, and in particular the Kikite people, uh, to host this event here today. We're pleased to host the first in a series of four indigenization brown bag sessions to advance the indigenization efforts and knowledge exchange here at JIBC. We hope you will also join us for upcoming sessions with Constable Steve Hanous with the Vancouver VPD. He's also the Musqueam First Nations liaison, <coughs> and he'll be here on March 22nd. Uh, John Sakamoto Kramer with the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Society and the Circles of Understanding Project will be here to join us on April 17th. And Tony Pennicott, author of the book Reconciliation, First Nations Treaty Making in BC on May 22nd. Today we're pleased to have Linda Gray, author of First Nations 101, present on the book, which is an easy to read primer that provides readers with a broad overview of the diverse and complex lives of First Nations people. She did bring copies of the book, so after she provides the overview, um, we're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes of questions, and then you can come up after and buy books from her. They're $20 each, and we really encourage that uh, because the money goes towards the Native, or the Native Youth Center. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, a dollar. <laughs> Close enough. But um, so Linda Gray is a member of the Tsimtian Nation on the northwest coast of BC. She is an active member of the First Nations community and serves on many community boards and committees in Vancouver. Her work is grounded in a strong belief in community development, youth empowerment, and culture as therapy. She has a bachelor's degree in social work from UBC, and she is the executive director of the Urban Native Youth Association, which is located in the downtown east side. And this is coincidentally where I first met Linda in the early 90s, as I've had a somewhat long history with Anya. I used to be on their board, so that's how I was first introduced to Linda. So I'm really pleased to have her join us here for the first indig indigenization session, and I would ask that you join me in welcoming her. Thank you. I'm gonna try to remember, watch my timing. We'll see how that works out. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people and particularly the Kakite uh, First Nations. Um, I'm Simsian, so I'm a visitor to this territories and I really hold my hands up and thanks for them for allowing me to live and work and play and everything else that I do in these territories. Um, they've always been really welcoming of me and my children, so I'm very, very um, thankful for that. So I don't know more. That's what's happening these days. And as soon as you say those words, people's 
thoughts come into mind, judgments come into mind, or questions come into mind. So when I was thinking about what I could talk to you about today during this very short session, this is, it'll all wrap up into the book eventually, so trust me on this, um, is when you hear people, there's, I would say, four generally types of people, or people fall into four categories of how I've seen this playing out so far. So you have the first people who say, you know, why don't they get a job and be idle no more? So they have a very distinct look at about what they have assumptions about what First Nations people are. They don't know the true history of this country. They make assumptions. They don't want to learn more. They can be judgmental. And I think of these people as being frustrated and not knowledgeable. And then you have a second set of people who they say, you know, we've given them enough and I didn't do that stuff to them and why can't we just get over that sort of stuff? And why can't we just move on? So these people have a skewed sense of fairness based on uh, individual or ethnocentric values and not, they're not concerned about justice so much, not so much concerned about justice for everybody or rights, responsibilities or the highest contracts in this land which are the treaties that were signed between our individual nations and what was to become Canada. And these people can be judgmental, sometimes racist, worried about competition for resources, entitled, and often can lash out. If you look anywhere on the internet right now, you'll find the most racist, vicious comments about First Nations people that you've ever seen. Um, anybody who, who was in denial about there being racism in this country can just Google idle no more and you'll come up with something. So. On the one hand, it's, uh, there's that, that's a little bright light at the end of this tunnel, tunnel for us is that it shows that this racism is quite rampant against First Nations people and there's a profound ignorance about their true history in this country and our shared history between na First Nations people and non-First Nations people. So then we have the third group of people who wonder what's happening that would actually bring First Nations people out by the tens, out by the hundreds, and out by the thousands in the dead of winter, out onto train tracks, traveling to Ottawa, and all of those sort of stuff. So these people, they want to learn more. They might stop and listen for a little bit. They'll start to seek out answers, or some of them will just move on. But at least we've raised a little bit of attention about what we think is interest, is what is in the interest of all people who live in this country. So I would call these people curious and em empathetic. And then the fourth group, they wonder, their question is, how can we live in a country that do does this to people? They know the history, they are allies, they want justice for all people, they see the benefits for all people in, this, in having the um, issues that are surround First Nations people addressed fairly within this country, and they wanna take action. So I call these people knowledgeable and frustrated. So I just kind of loosely came up with these categories last night when I was thinking about this, so there's no solid research behind it, but it's kind of what I'm thinking when I notice what's happening out there. And then of course you have the fifth group of people which I'll talk about after, which is the First Nations people ourselves. I'll talk about us in a few, in a minute. Um, so there are many more categories, but this shows that there's a lack of knowledge in, in this country about what the true history is between First Nations, non-First Nations people. In my opinion, it's a shared history. So you can talk about, if you talk about salmon, you talk about treaties, you talk about roadblocks, you talk about education, it's all a shared history. It affects uh, both of our groups, either negatively or positively to a different extent, depending on what the issue is. So, <coughs> excuse me. So there's a lack of knowledge and or understanding, but I always think of these things as an opportunity. So right now I think of it as Idle No More as a great opportunity to educate people. So where I work at the Urban Native Youth Association, we're gonna be doing some Idle No More teach-ins, we're trying to support some of the work that's going on right now <coughs> in the community, including something that's happened at the Friendship Center tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this is exactly why I wrote First Nations 101, which actually is now a national bestseller as of last August, by the way. So I'm pretty happy about that. Thank you. So there are lots of people who, why I wrote the book is because there's lots of people who want to learn more. There's, when I was going to college and university and during my work, there's always people who want to ask questions. 
about you know why why this and why that and as long as it's a respectful question and they want to understand why they're not saying um, you know where's all the fish or you know why guys why can't you guys just get over it those kind of questions I, I don't really have time for other than to give a quick little um, smackdown sometimes <laughs> but a quick little piece of information to say you know those aren't the best kind of questions if you really want to learn something then uh, well you could read my book or you could ask respectful questions so why I wrote it was that because really native people in art history in this country is not reflected in mainstream school systems or universities not in the books and not in media I wanted to try to dispel stereotypes and misinformation that there is about First Nations people. And we cannot, because really we cannot understand what's happening on an issue, say, at Awapiskat or Idle No More from media little sound bites that last 15 seconds or from sensational headlines. Um, everybody, including probably some of the people that are trained here, the police, understand how frustrating that could be to have your your issues and some sen something that sensationalized brought down to a three word headline and people make all kinds of assumptions. So it's really hard to try to, for us to try to fight to change, change what people are thinking and to bring about the truth. Um, and really I wanted people to help to understand the challenges and strengths and not to see First Nations people, especially our young people as problems. Um, sometimes, so the people who are making that assumptions, it really becomes a self-fulfilling self prophecy for themselves. They're, if they put that upon a young person or a native person in general, they're going to get back exactly what they're putting out. If you're putting out negative um, intentions and you're treating them badly, you'd, your walls are going to go up and you're going to get pushed back. So um, I want people to understand that. And this fifth group of people that I was talking about is First Nations people ourselves. Really, the stuff that I write about in the book, there's about just over 70 subjects in there that take you on a journey, really, from what our, our communities used to look like until what's happened when non-First Nations people first came here during first contact, and a lot of the policies and laws and actions that have changed things for much for the worse for First Nations people. And then so what have some of the fallout of that? So a lot of the negative statistics that you see that Native people fall into, it's there's got to be a reason for it. And, um, <coughs> sorry, I should have asked for a, a glass of water. I don't know why I didn't, even though I knew there was going to be this giant light on me. Um, so when we think about how is it possible for First Nations people to know just about ourselves and our cultures when it was so systematically kept from us? How are we supposed to know, you know, what's happening with fishing or treaties or all of those sort of things? Like, it's almost impossible for anybody to know all of this stuff. I happen to know a little bit about a lot of things, and there are very, very generous people who are out there who taught me a lot of things, and it took decades for me to know the information that's in the book. And there's people every single day, such as Cheryl, who are saying exactly the same things that are in that book. And Dave's doing it over at um, Douglas College, and people are everywhere. So it's not just me doing this. I just happen to be the first one who wrote the book, who took ta the time to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other reason is so that youth could be reach their full, pot full potential so that they're, despite other people's stereotypes and low expectations and the barriers that are put up for them, um, our ancestors talk about the seven generations to come. They remind us that we're responsible for seven generations ahead. So whatever decision that we take today will have, have either a negative or a positive impact for the next seven generations to come. So it's our responsibility to act in the best interest of our peoples. And um, a last summer I actually heard for the first time Thank you. Is somebody who talked about the seven generations as in you look back for three generations and you learn from your ancestors and then we're the fourth generation and then we think about the next three generations to come. So whichever different First Nations think of it is differently, but generally that's what a lot of First Nations people talk about. So, and the reason that I wrote the book the way that I did is because people really want, I was trying to make it as accessible as possible from the design of the jacket to the short pieces of information. So there's over 70 um, subjects in there. Things are two to three pages long and then there's a list of resources at the end. Some of the longer chapters are justice is like six or seven pages long. Urbanization's a little bit longer. 
Um, and some things are just, um, most things are two or three pages long, so you can learn, there's, it's really jam-packed. I'm a concise writer, thank goodness. And then you could learn some more from very um, important documents and research that's out there, even though on one hand there's hardly anything about us, that there are some good pieces of information, even if they just say there's nothing out there, it's um, educational in itself. So Idle No More was born really out of a frustration. It was three First Nations women and a non-First Nations woman who just said, you know what, the things that are happening in this country are so devastating to First Nations people and it's starting to affect everybody. And that's part of the reason why other people are starting to <coughs> pick up is because these women said, <coughs> I'm gonna be, we're gonna be idle no more. We can't sit by and just watch this continue to deteriorate and deteriorate. And thank goodness for the internet. Um, actually, Facebook and the internet is one of the most empowering things that has come along um, to help First Nations people get the truth out there. So when you hear about Idle No More, or you hear about Attawapiskat, or you hear about all of the chiefs who are making a million dollars a year, and all of this misinformation that's out there, if you Google any of this information, you have some native person who's trying their best to get uh, the truth out. So um, if you wanna know what the truth is, look for alternate sources. Don't just trust the Bank of the Sun for your headlines or even CBC who's supposed to be great at what they do. They have, you know, some of their reporters aren't the best or they give you little snippets of information. Without knowing the context or what's led up to something, you really can't understand what the situation is. So I encourage people to use that medium to um, educate yourselves. One of the most frustrating things for me around the Idle No More movement is the media saying, and other people, politicians saying that, you know, what's their message? Why can't they just get their message straight? As if we're one giant homogenous group who's all uh, represented by um, Sean Atlio, the chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Well, really, it's simply not that easy. But for myself, when I think about what's the main message, the common message is that Canada must recognize respect and fully implement treaties, outstanding land claims and adhere to the constitution. And if they do that, which is their actual legal responsibility to do as a country, if they do that stuff, education, justice, housing, water, everything else is gonna be taken care of. So if people need one little piece of information for us to focus on, that's what underline every message that you hear people talking about, that's what it is. If those things were taken care of, as, as much effort and time and resources went into helping our communities try to heal from the onslaught of all of the externally imposed policies such as the residential school system, if we had as much effort put to try to help our, our peoples recover from that many, many generations of um, <coughs> impact, then things would change really, really quickly within our community. I've seen the changes, as I'm sure Cheryl has, in the last 10 or 20 years as Native people started to talk about the residential school system and to get rid of some of that shame um, that's an anger that's associated with that and start to pick up the teachings of our ancestors and to think about culture and to pull the very best out of whatever our culture is. And you see the difference that it makes in the lives, especially of young people, who then have that sense of belonging and self-pride and a sense of purpose and duty to their community, <coughs> excuse me. So when you think about, um, there's over 600 First Nations community in the country, and there's many political groups, diverse needs, and then you think about um, asking all of us to agree on one single issue and to have one person speak for us. When you watch anything about the provinces, the provinces can't even agree. They can't agree on transfer payments, they can't agree on health care. Even in within British Columbia, we can't agree on whether or not we should have a police force, one single police force. Um, and you think about TransLink, like an, a, um, a transportation plan here in Metro Vancouver, people can't agree on that. And yet we're supposed to agree, the million, 1.4 million of us are supposed to agree on one single message and have one person talk for us. It's absolutely outrageous, especially considering that we are individual First Nations people and we are individual First Nations who have signed treaties or are trying to sign treaties with what is now known as the Government of Canada. So 
we're here at the Justice Institute of DC, so when we talk about justice, you cannot talk about justice in this country without talking about First Nations people and First Nations um, constitutional and treaty rights. Um, until those are met, again, I'll say it once more, until those are actually lived up to and fully implemented in the way that they were intended, not the way that they're being interp interpreted now, is um, there cannot be any true peace of reconciliation in this country. So when we talk about treaties, treaties are, as I said, the highest contract in the land. They were signed before Canada became a country. They were signed before the British North American Act. They were purposely signed with, for I with individual nations. It wasn't signed with a group of native people or in a region or with an ing individual person. Those people back then recognized that there was an individual nation who had the rights and responsibilities for that individual piece of territory. So now we have people who are talking about, well, you know, can we accommodate them? Should we, you know, share revenue? Should we ask them, you know, do consultation with them? Well, yes, you have to. It's the highest law on the land. It's in the Constitution. It's in the treaties. And it's international law that you have to do those sort of things. That's what it was signed on for. And I always find it quite um, frustrating, a little bit hilarious, that um, in a country, especially with the government that we have in, in the federal government right now, who talks about, um, well, I guess fairness, but they, you know, everything's about contracts. When you talk about anything that's economic, it's all about contracts. We're gonna sign this treaty with China so that they could come in here and they could do this, and we're gonna dis diminish native people's rights if if they set up a roadblock and we're gonna make them pay for it and all of these sort of stuff, all of a sudden those treaties are the most important document that could ever be had written anywhere. But when you talk about the treaties that help this country to form, they're not taken seriously. <coughs> and then you have people saying outrageous things like the courts need to interpret it or you can't do revenue sharing or they're tired of giving us things. Well, there, those treaties, again, are contracts. There were things that were in those contracts that said, yes, you're supposed to supply us with health. And I write about all this stuff in the book, so I'm gonna just, in the short amount of time that I have, I'm gonna whip through things. And um, hopefully I'll have a chance to either buy a book or read the book from the library. Um, now I've kind of gone over. So, but quite often we're forced to go into the Canadian um, justice system. We have to go into the court system to fight for our rights from the people who are judging whether or not they are our rights. So it's heavily weighted in, in favor of the country. It's about individual ownership, it's about law, and it's about contracts, yet they don't stand up to our contracts. And so this is why Idle No More is necessary, and this is why First Nations 101 is necessary, and it's why it's necessary to have an indigenization within here and any other schools because people need to understand this, what the true history of this country is. And there needs to be a meaningful effort to engage native people so that we can feel safe and uh, confident enough to come in and take hold of the opportunities around education. So for those of you who might come into contact with First Nations people in your work, what I encourage you to remember is that yes, we are overrepresented in many of the negative stats that are in this country, but there's a reason for that. If you think about residential schools, there's lots of talk about residential schools, but most people do not understand what the true day-to-day -day effects of it are. I talk about this in the book. For myself, I grew up in a single household with a mother who ex had extreme, she, extreme, she experienced extreme racism up in Prin Prince Rupert. Um, and jealousy and all kinds of other things. So she is down here as a single mother of six children. And we grew up in the projects and we didn't know our language. I didn't even know that I was the first, what my first nation was until I was in my teens. <coughs> and we lived in extreme poverty. And my mom had her addictions which helped her to mask her pain, which is the same thing for many native people who haven't been able to recover from the things that have happened yet. Um, I left high school when I was 16. I became a teenage parent, had two children by the time I was 19. I didn't have any parenting skills. It was such a, such a struggle for me to learn how to be a parent. And thank goodness I had good people around me and I was open to try to learn. So my children are doing fantastic. I'm extremely proud of them and the decisions that they're making. Um, 
and I've nev I had never been up to my traditional territories in all of that time either. And I had no access to culture. I knew what a lot of other people think, you know, the, the Plains Indian who wanders the plains and there's teepees everywhere. Like that's what I thought an Indian was. I didn't know that there was individual First Nation or that I was a West Coast First Nation until I was like uh, maybe 16 or 17 years old once I was out on my own. So lots of people dismiss and say, well, residential schools are over, they're, they're done. My children's father was in residential school. My children and myself, I didn't go to residential school, thank goodness, but um, you know, generations before me did and my children were, have been impacted by that because I didn't know how to be a parent. Their dad didn't know how to be a parent. Their dad had many struggles and most of the people around us are still trying to recover from all of the, that's happened. So when you talk about the residential schools, it was over 100, 100 years, 130 schools across this country. And it was not a, in a single community, not a single region, not a single province. It was across this entire country and it was an entire people. If you think about for yourself, if your mother and your grandmother and your grandmother's grandmother, grandmother go back seven or eight generations and every single one of them went to a residential school for 10 years, you're taken out of your home at the age of four, five, six years old and you're there for 10 months of the year and maybe you can go home, maybe you can't. And you, during that time, you're, you not only lost a lot of the good things that we had about our culture, but lots and lots and lots of negative behaviors were introduced so, and one of the worst things that happened, uh, the losses for us, was our coping skills. We had all kinds of ceremonies and rites of passage and transition things that helped us to be um, just healthy people. Like it helped us through those transition times and difficult times. All of that was taken away from us. So when we were all thrown back on the reserve and you know, for a couple of months, we had parents who had gone through the exact same thing. All of these people were just like in one little tiny area where they had to um, try to cope. Like, what do you do? You try to be a good parent, but you weren't taught that. With, when people were at residential schools, they weren't given hugs, they weren't given encouragement. Maybe on an individual basis, some were sometimes, but predominantly there was nothing but, uh, nothing but negative behaviors that were taught there. So the intergenerational effects that continue to affect people, it was inevitable. It's gonna take as much effort as it did a hundred more years. And all of, think about all of the money and energy and effort that was put in. All of the great things that native people have contributed to the making of this country. Uh, we don't need to talk about all of the, um, the dire things that happened in residential schools, but they should be aware of that residential schools existed. I run into a lot of non-native people who are, once they hear about this, they're angry, 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 angry that they did not grow up knowing about this in their country. And what I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago is like, what is so shameful in a country that a government actively tries to hide that truth from its citizens? What kind of shame, what kind of shameful things have they done and what is that, what could happen out of that, that there is an active movement to try to, to keep that truth from its citizens. That is something really for people to think about. When I think about that, it's like, wow. It says so much about a country that does that and they're all worried about everywhere, everybody else in the, the um, international community. Sorry, I went on a little rant there, but not a rant. And there are rants in the book, by the way. I have these uh, <laughs> sections that are just called rants. <laughs> Uh, so when I talk about mascots and, you know, what it means to our people, some people think we should be pri proud that, you know, there's a Chicago Blackhawks and all that sort of stuff, but I don't quite see it that way. If you want to know more, you'll have to read about it in the book. Um, but when you do talk about First Nations people, we do have, even though we are very, very diverse, in, in BC, that's the most linguistically diverse place, second most linguistically diverse place in North America. We have many, many nations that are within this province. And, but we all, one thing that I know for sure is that across North America is that even though we have diverse cultures and they've all evolved out of geographic necessity and weather and all that sort of stuff, is that we have a common worldview. 
We all believe in taking care of the land. We believe in, take in our ancestors. We believe in spirituality. We believe in community, and we think that our children are sacred. At least that's the way it used to be. That's what I strive for every day. And tell such a time that all of our people go back to the teachings of our ancestors, it'll, it'll be a tough road ahead. But each one of us can try to do something different. Each one of us can try to contribute to that. When you see a native person walking down the street, a young person, don't get scared and walk across the street like some people do. You know, give them a nod or a smile or something. That can be one of the most important things in the, the lives of a young person. I remind the staff at Anya that sometimes a native youth is the one uh, positive thing that you say to them that day may not just be the thing that they hear that day, but it may be the only positive thing they hear about themselves that week or that month. I remember the people who said positive things to me or gave me encouragement when I was a young person. Those are those little seeds that are planted that have you know, led to me being able to write a book and to stand here and to feel proud to be a First Nations woman and to, despite all of the things that have happened to me in my lifetime, I would never, ever, ever decide to come back to be something different. There's far too much strength and beauty and spirituality and gifts that the Creator have given us as a First Nations person. And my greatest hope is that everybody begins to understand that every, everything comes around. Everyone's talking about the environment and everyone's talking about we need to build community again. You just need to look at what First Nations people's beliefs are. And you're right there, you're right back to it. So we don't need a bunch of research and we don't need a bunch of fancy reports to be able to tell us what we need to do to protect what we call Mother Earth. Native people call it Mother Earth, in my opinion, is because she sustains us. Without her having her ecosystems that allow animals to grow and plants to grow that so that we can eat, that um, and water to go up to the clouds and to come back down we could not live without our mother the earth and that's why especially with idle no more you hear people talking about mother earth and that's the main reason i think i'm about five minutes eh? okay um one of the things that i wanted to talk to you quickly about is when we talk about reconciliation it includes allowing us to just be ourselves and sometimes that's just getting out of the way so that you're not, um, so that you're not putting up barriers, so that we cannot learn our own history, so that we can't learn our cultural teachings, so that we can't be safely amongst ourselves. And other ways is to advocate. Who do you vote for? Do you vote for people who actually care about community, and that means everybody, native and non-native people, that care about children, that care about um, ensuring that people are getting a proper education in this country. Every time there's an election, we make a a conscious decision about what kind of life we want to live in this land, not just about who's going to govern. So when we, when I talk about culture in the book, I talk about my one chapter is called culture. What's the big deal? For us, really, culture is what it, it for me is our inherent right as a First Nations person. It gives us a sense of belonging, a sense of self-esteem, pride. It's true regard regardless of whether you're growing up First Nations or not. I remember when I first started to learn some of this stuff, it just like, uh, you know, like big light bulb went off and I was just like, it just rang so incredibly true for me. I'm one of those people who believes in um, genetic memory or blood memory. I think that it's instilled, uh, instilled as us as a people from what our, our ancestors um, knew and it's a gift from the creator to be that connected. Um, it gives us a healthy place to belong <coughs> and when we don't have healthy places to belong, it's replaced by gangs or by bad relationships. And residential schools led to a lot of internalized racism and low self-esteem. The best way to counteract that is to help us to rebuild our self-esteem or to just let us do it, to try to stand up against acts of racism and uh, misinformation that's out there about the true history of First Nations people or what's happening. Um, and for me, culture is really, I, I talked a little bit about our worldview earlier, like that's what we all have in common. And culture is, for me, it's an expression of our worldview. So the dances and the songs 
and the cere not the ceremony so much, but um, not the spiritual ceremonies, is an ex it's an expression of our worldview. So that's the bit of a difference for me. So there's a huge resurgence right now, and we try to do as much as we can. People talk about um, some people who live on reserve are very judgmental and think that because we're an urban urban natives that we have no access to culture and we don't know what it means to be a native person. But in some senses, the, well, it depends on which community you look at. Some First Nations community have hardly any access to culture. They talk, you know, they might drum and they sing, but they don't have the teachings behind it. They don't do the ceremonies. And other ones are very, very cultural and they have some of their old people who didn't go to residential schools. Some of those elders who can give them the true teachings. And then you have people who are in the city who we're making every single effort that we can to try to teach our young people about culture even if it's some of the more, um, something that's diverse, so it's our, about our ancestors or about the, um, I, once I get start getting down to that last few minutes, I'm just like, go, 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 and then I get stumbled, so about the uh, medicine wheel or that sort of stuff, so I just think that it's really important, and some of us, we call it culture as therapy, because it really does, what we find is that once young people find out about their heritage and they have access to elders and they know what it means, truly means to be a First Nations person, they start to live healthier, safer lives. So really I think of it as uh, therapy unto itself. So I'm gonna skip past a couple of things here so we can have time for questions. Um, a couple of very effective ways to work with First Nations people in my opinion is to is culture as therapy, what I just talked about, because it gives people a reconnection or a connection, pride, belonging, and healing. And then the circle of courage, which is Dr. Wilkenleg and the people that he works with, if you ever get a chance to listen to him, the circle of courage talks about the importance of independence, belonging, generosity, and mastery. Um, and it, a lot of their work talks about how we as adults need to figure out how we are keeping youth out of the community. What are the barriers that we are setting up so that youth cannot come in, have, feel like they're welcome and that they have a place within the circle. And then Just Therapy, and Just Therapy comes out of New Zealand and that's, they called it Just Therapy because they had a realization that therapy is just therapy. It like it's not everything. You have to think about the family systems and everything that's going on in that person's lives that can all happen in the counseling room. And it's also called Just Therapy because it's based on justice and social justice so that the um, people need time to n know what their history is and to have um, some healing around that. So first thing, I'll say a little bit about First Nations 101 quickly, is that okay? So it's national bestseller, I said, and uh, a lot of universities, college, high schools, government offices, not-for-profit boards and staff training, tourists, religious-based organizations are using it for reconciliation efforts. So it's been used far and wide, and I'm very fortunate to get people sending me emails all the time about you know, the difference that it's made in the way that they think about things. So very happy about that. And so I, I wrote this book over about four years, just in the evenings and the weekends. I did it on my own time. Um, off and on, I'd go for a couple months and I'd leave it for a few months. So um, I wound up self, I had signed with um, Douglas and McIntyre and then things didn't work out there. So I self-published. So I taught myself how to design a book by looking at YouTube videos. And um, my niece helped me set up my Facebook page and I set up my website and uh, sold over 6,000 copies. So it's been going really good. So every, out of every book, whether I sell it or I give it away, I give a dollar to the, to the Native Youth Center Capital Campaign that the organization I work for is doing. Because I have such, I know how much difference that will make in the lives of young people. To have a safe place that has everything in one space so that they can just come and take hold of the opportunities that they have an inherent right to have. So, so far I've donated $6,000, so, um, Actually, I won't even talk about that. But if you like First Nations 101 on Facebook, that would be great. Um, my website is firstnations101.com if you want to send people that way. And then I just want to leave people with a question or a few questions. And what can each, so it's what can each of you do to help work towards true reconciliation in this country? 
what is your responsibility? What is your opportunity? Can you do it in your family? Can you do it where you work? Can you do it where you go to school? Can you, do you know, if you found something in what I've talked about today or what you might read in First Nations 101 as meaningful in your lives and that you find um, truthful, then if you can share that with another person, I'd be most grateful for myself and for the seven generations to come. So, thank you. Yep, I'll stay here. So I uh, thank you. That was great. I'm so glad that you were able to come and share that with us. Um, I'm going to be circulating around if there's any questions. So I was wondering if people wanted to put their hands up if you have any. It's a bit of a long walk, so <laughs> it's okay. And sorry for the rush, sir. In 45 minutes, you can only say so much, and you know there's a whole whole book to cover. Hi, Linda. Thanks. Thanks for coming and talking to us. I think this is uh, obviously very important and, and critical, not only for the country, but it's certainly an important part of what we're trying to spearhead here at the JIVC. Yeah. What I'd really be interested in hearing from you is um, if things were different, if justice was done, uh, if the rights of Native peoples were being respected, what specifically, could you cite two or three examples of what you would see tomorrow or experience that's different than what is happening today that would be really concrete evidence that, that sincere attempts are being made to provide that justice? The Native Youth Center would be fully funded and built in the next couple of years. <laughs> that's a given for me. Um, well, I think that if uh, First Nations or the true history of this country was meaningfully included in the curriculum in elementary school and high school and the colleges and universities of this land, that would be, that would be one of the biggest things because once truth comes out, you can't turn back from truth. So. That's one of the things. I think that if our children felt that, and actually this is something that would affect all children. If racism and bullying was addressed positively in schools, our kids, I, th I believe, are dispropor disproportionately affected by bullying, as they call it, even though it's outright acts of racism. And I don't call it high school dropout. I call it high school pushout. So once they make schools more welcoming rel and relevant to our children, that'll be a sure sign of it. And once people are, um, the child welfare system is actually supporting our families to recover from all of this onslaught of things that are happening and quit blaming us for not having good parenting skills when it was actually taught to us to not be good parents, that if efforts were made to keep our children in their homes safe and happy within their extended family or otherwise, that would be some of the most significant change, not just for Native people, but for anybody. Um, you know, if, I, if Stephen Harper was here today, he would be worried about money and about jobs. Well, our kids wouldn't be in jail and they wouldn't be um, parents when they're 14 years old and, you know, our elders would be living longer, they wouldn't have diabetes and, you know, just the amount of money that would be saved in the, the social safety net would be tremendous. And then, you know, we would be, many more of our people would be as part of the economy as they keep saying that that's what they wanted to be if that's what they so choose. <coughs> so there's lots of ways that you would see an immediate um, drop in the, the cost for those sorts of things. Great, any more questions? Linda, I'm curious about the role of fetal alcohol effect and syndrome is going up, going down uh, with young people. Um, I would say that it's a mixture. I think, you know, some of the things like oxycodone and all of the other things are, you know, alcohol and oxycodone and everything else is just another way us to mask our pain so until that pain is gone until there's meaningful efforts for us to try to recover from this stuff that it's gonna there's gonna be those effects on children unfortunately 
Um, I don't know what the what the stats are on it, but it's not going down for sure. Whether or not it's going up, I'm not sure. But there's far, you know, even though we're three times the rate of the non non native community in our in having children, we're still a lot a lot of our children are waiting until they're um, out of their teens at least before they start having children. My son's going to be 30 soon, and my daughter's 32, and they don't have any children. And I'm just like, that's the one stereotype you didn't need to not, you didn't need to break. I'm just anxiously waiting for grandbabies to come. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's as much as I could say to it. Linda, is, is fetal alcohol syndrome or effect um, genetically passed on from, I mean, I, I think of youngsters in, I was a teacher, and if those youngsters have children, do you know medically whether it's passed from generation to generation? I don't, I don't know for sure, but I've never heard of that. But what um, Dr. Brokenleg and the other people at Reclaiming Youth talk about and it's, um, sorry, usually I bring a, a handout of places that I think people could find more information, and maybe I'll send that to Cheryl, but um, Reclaiming talks a lot about not, like, genetic memory and how much stress and that sort of stuff plays on the function of the brain and how that negatively affects a child and their, their ability to learn, their ability to cope. So it's more about trauma and stress than it is about alcohol in our community is what I believe. And when you hear him and um, Larry Bernard, Bernard, Bernardo, I think is how you say his last name, when you hear them talk about it, it makes things make so much sense about why things have not been able to change. Not just for us, but you know, people in what they call the ghetto or the projects and you know, people who are just having a hard time who have experienced lots of trauma and throughout their family. maybe something about 60,000 people living in uh, town. And in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the number of First Nations people will exceed the number of all other people uh, in the next 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. So you're not talking about a minority, you're, you're talking about a huge number of people. And, and it seems to me that the long range goal should be to have life on the reserve viable and for First Nations people to live in towns and cities viably, and to have some sort of system where people can, can choose whether or not they want to live on a reserve and, and know that they can successfully move to the city or the town. I, is, is that the long range goal? Yeah, I don't know if it's a goal, but it's a reality for sure. It uh, is a reality or it yeah, should be? Yeah, it, well, it, no, it should be. Yeah, it absolutely should be. Um, we obviously have the choice of where we want to live now um, in that we can leave, but we don't necessarily have the choice of whether or not we could stay safely or whether or not we could stay because there's no school there or because there's no training or there's no um, work there. So choice is a very, very ambiguous word to be using when with the Native community. Well, if you're talking about our traditional territories as opposed to a reserve, which is like one little tiny postage stamp of our, of what we should have, if it was, if you're talking about living in our traditional territories, then absolutely yes, but not necessarily on reserve because I, I don't believe in the reserve system. Although, in another um, another dim light at the end of the tunnel is like having us on reserves is actually help us maintain our culture in our sense of community. So, you know, that's one of the very, very few th positive things that have come out of a, a reserve system. Absolutely. Just on a note with that, I think it's important to say that um, sometimes we have agendas that come out in terms of not just research, but governance, uh, where it's an assimilationist 
assimilationist agenda, and I think that's what we have to get beyond. So living in an urban environment doesn't, as Linda says, doesn't mean we're gonna lose our culture. In particular, we have such diverse communities, including non-status Indians, um, people who maybe were adopted out, et cetera, uh, and who, are com who come from mixed marriages. So this can allow them in the urban environment to still access culture. So culture does live in both places, um, at the same time, we have to move away from thinking, because I think there was this drive to say, oh, people should be urbanized, um, and this happened in the early 70s in the United States and here in Canada. But we have to get beyond that to say it's about choice, so whether First Nations want to move, and also Métis communities. We have to understand how different Métis communities are um, in that spectrum. And I think the Inuit and the North as well are experiencing this, like many of the people have to move south in order to get education. So I think this is gonna be a question that we have to continue grappling with, but it's an important one and that we need to maintain those ties. I, I did grow up on reserve and um, I have a deep attachment to my own territory. So that's something that is always with me. So I hate when people ask, ask me, so, so where are you from? <laughs> Like, well, I'm from Seam First Nation. I also was living in Ottawa, and I'm kind of from Vancouver as well. I'm from the Vancouver Urban Aboriginal Community. So that co question becomes so much more complex when we bring in um, where our roots, territoriality, than also living in urban communities, because I feel very attached to the Urban Aboriginal Community here in Vancouver. So yes, it's very complex, <laughs> many questions, no simple answers, but... Um, there's another question here, and then I as well have a quick question for you. And is there, oh, is there a question back, no? Is there anyone else who has questions before we sort of start wrapping up? Okay. I was just wondering if you could give a bit of a one-on-one -on, -one on some distinctions between Métis and First Nations. Like, I'm, I guess I'm confused in understanding if the designation of Métis is more like a historical one because, I mean, I know people, I have a former colleague who, um, she has long blonde hair and blue eyes, and everywhere she goes, she gets jobs without interviews, and she really has a family over there, and she found out she's First Nations. Mm -hmm. And so then I get, I start wondering, well, at what point are people considered First Nations? At what point are they Métis? Is Métis, because my understanding was Métis was... Um, of mixed heritage, but then there are people now who are, for I'm confused. Yeah, you love the chapter in my book about <laughs> Métis and what it actually means. Um, some people talk about big M Métis and little M Métis. So one of, the, one of the things that for sure is not is a half-breed or somebody who's mixed blood. That does not mean that you're Métis. The original Métis go back to pre-confederation as they call it and you know the Red River District and some other ones where it was actually those people were you know native and either Scottish or or French and something else those were the first original Métis and they took script from the government and you know they had very distinct things but they're still First Nations people like Métis is something that another one of those names that has been imposed upon us um, really because if my children, if I had children with a non-native person, they're not Métis. But, you know, if the government today said, okay, those are all Métis people, then they'd be start called, they'd have a Métis card, which is ridiculous. And it's again, those people calling us, you know, whatever they want to call us. So I have a one page that just has a bunch of the names all ju jumbled up about what we've been called just in my lifetime. Um, so for sure, there's lots and lots of controversy about it, both within the broader Aboriginal community, I don't like that word myself, and with the Métis communi community itself. So some people say, unless you go absolutely prove your heritage back to the Red River District and these particular families, you're not Métis. And other ones are, well, whoever says that they are, and they could kind of trace their lineage back. So they're going through a lot of internal struggles themselves. And then, of course, there's been the case that just happened that says, you know, that uh, off-reserve and Métis people have a distinct place within this country, too. But, of course, the government of Canada is going to appeal that, so that'll be another 40 years before that's <laughs> taken care of. <laughs> but for sure, you need to uh, either read about it in my book or somewhere else. It's a very, very complex and uh, contentious issue. Can I ask another quick question? 
just um, uh, in one of the books I wrote, I had a little tiny section um, on uh, First Nations and Aboriginal Inuit. And so I, I wanted to make sure everything I wrote was correct. And so I called up the, uh, uh, the um, residential schools project to ask them to check my vocabulary. And they said, oh, well, we just call ourselves Indian, but you know what? We're probably not the right people to ask. I'm going to talk to my boss and have her get back to you because we always just say Indian, but that's probably not correct. But they were First Nations. So then I thought, well, how can it be? They, they're saying, we're not sure what we're supposed We just say Indian, but that's probably not the correct term. So In I thought, my oh, opinion, oh. it's definitely not the correct term. Um, and I write about this in the book, of course. Down in the States, it's very different. Like a lot of them, like, you know, you hear the NRA say out of my cold dead hands. Well, for them, their treaty rights are very, very aligned with that word Indian. So they are, they hang on to it because that's their rights as First Nations people of that, of what's now the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the thing is that if you ask me what I am, I am Sinsan first and foremost. You can call me a First Nations person because I'm a member of a First Nation of this land. But I, I'm, I say native because my organization is called Native Urban Native Youth Association. And the Indian Residential School Survivor Society probably say Indian because that's in their name. You know what I mean? If some native people use it as a way as an internal joke or as a way of reclaiming. But usually we say it amongst ourselves. Most people find it offensive for non-native people to, uh, I guess, impose that word upon us. But Indian? Pardon? The word Indian? The word Indian, yeah. And I really don't like the word Aboriginal because any other, almost any other word that you look at in the dictionary that starts with the word ab means not, like abnormal, not normal, or ab whatever. And then all of a sudden, even though it says in the dictionary that how many people are going to look in the dictionary to see what ab, Aboriginal means? But I think like even, you know, subconsciously, they're going to think not original. So I... I use that word if I have to, if I'm around government and they need me to say that so they understand what I'm talking about. But uh, I, I really don't like that word. I think First Nations is the most appropriate unless you're calling a person by what their actual nation is because we are and always have been the First Nations of this land. Well, it makes sense. Uh, when I went to Europe all the time, people said, so, so you're American, Where, what city are you from? And I said, no, actually, I'm Canadian. They said, Oh well, we call that American too. <laughs> we call America, and I didn't like it, so it makes a lot of sense. Great. I uh, just want to say thank you to all of you who stayed to the end. Um, I just have a really quick question for Linda. I was wondering, in terms of um, what you talked about in the book, you're a role model in the community here in Vancouver. So I was wondering how you, as a mother, um, overcame the intergenerational residential school trauma. Um, you know, as a role model, and you give so much back to the community. So I know we all have our personal stories of struggle, and I wanted to know how, how you did overcome this and how we can take something out of that, um, and that maybe continues today with the work that you do with Anya. Sure. Um, actually, that was in my notes, and I, I skipped over it, so I'm actually glad that you asked it, because people quite often ask it, you know, then why are you doing so well? And sometimes people ac ask it res respectfully, and sometimes they don't. Um, one of the most important things that I learned when I went to the School of Social Work and somebody was talking about uh, intergenerational counseling was that each of us is made up of three distinct things and one is resiliency, so our ability to bounce back from adversity and the other one's our personality, so we're really outgoing or we withdrawn or we somewhere in the middle and um, our temperament, so are we hot-headed or are we really sullen and you know where are you along that scale? And I think that I happen to be one of the lucky people who is, or fortunate people who's kind of even on all three of those things. And you know, what he really made clear to us was that it, when he told us that it really made sense to me why each one of the people in my family, each one of us siblings had such a different experience from all the things that we experienced growing up, was you know, some of us had a harder time and you know, didn't have that ability to bounce back as quickly. Um, but the good news is that we can teach those things. We can teach people to be resilient, and that's what we try to do at Anya, is to try to give them the skills so that they can be resilient and to help them to recognize in themselves what might not be such a healthy or, yeah, not, not so healthy reaction so that they're, you know, 
the helping them with their temper a little bit if they're having um, uh, violence violence issues I guess is the easiest way to say it so and for me I think I was really um, for me alcohol really scared me it really really scared me I was so I didn't use alcohol so that was one of the good good things for me like I was afraid to not have control of the situation because I was I've growing up I was so worried about safety personal safety so um, really in some sense it's uh, it's just an individual thing but it's like you say like it's we have to give opportunities for young people and anybody to be able to learn some of those other skills so that they can compensate for you know what is an inherent um, thing that they're born with so I think meaningful opportunities that are accessible that um, youth will come and they'll make the best out of it so I think there's such great potential native youth are the largest untapped natural resource in this country um, until people realize that things just they cannot get better and even within our own community sorry this is kind of going off your question but you know we they're so you know, we'll have a youth committee or we'll have a youth member on the committee, like that sort of thing. And you know this from when you were n a young person, even within our own community, even though 60% of us are under the age of 25, they're still being ignored so much. And I don't know who those people think are going to take care of us in 20 years when we're, uh, you know, on old age pension. But um, people, even uh, within our own community, start need to give in, start need to be giving more meaningful opportunities for young people to learn and to grow and to just be healthy, happy people. Well, thank you. So let's uh, give a round of applause for Linda. Okay. And she'll be doing book signing. So if any of you, any of you want to purchase a book, please feel free to do so. And she'll be available for a little bit now. <laughs>